Hi everyone, I'm Greg Watson from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. In this module I'm going to be talking about software testing and how it is used in the development process for scientific computing. Uh, this is the just the usual licensing and acknowledgements slide. I'll just point out that if you want to cite this work, we provide a, a citation there for you to use. Okay, this module is divided into two parts. In the first part, I'll introduce some testing concepts and terminology, talk about some of the challenges of testing in the context of scientific computing, and then show you an example of how to set up a Python project with testing, as well as how to use CMake's C-Test framework for a C++ C++ project. In the second part, I'll walk you through how to use a testing methodology on a larger and more complex project. Okay, this presentation hopefully will provide uh, some useful advice for a variety of different groups. Um, the first are those who are new to software testing and are looking for advice and help on how to get started. The second group are those who are working with legacy projects uh, that need to use a testing system or need to integrate a testing system uh, with their existing code. And then the third group are those who have been using testing but are looking at ways to improve their testing practices on an existing project. There's a lot of theory and associated terminology about testing that can sometimes be confusing. So for this tutorial, we're focusing on what's known as dynamic testing, um, which is testing by executing the code itself. Um, often tests are also separated into functional and non-functional types. So functional testing is systematic text testing against a set of requirements or specifications, while non-functional testing is related to how the program operates or behaves, such as if it can, uh, can complete a task in a certain amount of time or if there are any security weaknesses or vulnerabilities and so forth. There are many different types of tests and testing strategies. We'll just mention a few common ones here. Um, the first three of these form somewhat of a hierarchy. So at the bottom, we have unit testing, which is really to check that a single routine or function um, is operating correctly. At the next level, integration testing is used to check that a group of modules or components or functions operate correctly together. Um, and then at the next level, system testing checks that the program operates correctly as a whole and also meets the specified requirements. Then there's a couple of other uh, different strategies. Regression testing is used to check that um, some changes that you might have introduced into the code have not made any sort of unintended changes to the program behavior. Um, so you want to check that if you've made some changes that the program still is working the way it's supposed to work. Acceptance testing, on the other hand, is similar to system testing in that it checks the program as a whole. However, instead of checking with respect to some set of specifications or requirements, it's used to ensure that the program meets the requirements of the customer. So how does testing relate to verification and validation? Well, unfortunately, the terminology is different if you're talking about scientific computing and or software engineering. So in software engineering, verification is checking that the software conforms to the requirements and the design. Um, and this is not always just testing uh, because you may be checking that you're meeting certain requirements that are documented and so forth. Um, but testing plays a role in the verification process to check that each aspect of the software is working the way it's supposed to. In scientific computing, on the other hand, verification aims to ensure that the code is a correct representation of an underlying mathematical model. So in, in uh, scientific computing, verification involves typically comparing a model solution to a reference solution, checking for convergence or those types of things. Um, 
uh, on the software engineering side, validation is used to determine if the code meets the customer needs. Um, so it requires system level or acceptance testing to be performed. In the scientific computing space, validation is more complex typically, and it involves determining the accuracy of the model, comparing the outputs with experimental results, and may also involve using the computational model to make predictions that can be verified. Scientific software development is a complex process um, and involves expertise in many different subject areas. Domain experts uh, have a set of models in mind and propose equations required to solve a problem. And they should have also considered validation checks arising from physical and mathematical properties of their models, um, such as conserved quantities, analytical solutions, and so forth. Applied mathematicians uh, work with solvers and discretizations. They should contribute a good understanding of functional spaces and convergence criteria which address model fidelity, accuracy, and stability. Computer scientists and software engineers map the problem details into programming languages, um, and uh, they contribute things like extensible interoperable frameworks, um, which focus on productivity and performance. For this whole project team to work together effectively, they need to iterate on features that move towards their science objectives. Testing happens at many points in this process and is, in is essential for ensuring that the desired outcomes are achieved. Testing is required at many points during the software development life cycle, as I just mentioned. But when do you actually write the tests? Um, often testing is left until very uh, last possible minute, um, code is written and then tests are added sometime later either to ensure that requirements are met, um, to address deficiencies that may be encountered or perhaps a bug has been discovered and the vendor requires tests that demonstrate the issue um, and so the developers go and write those tests. Um, however, rather than adding the tests as an afterthought, um, it's been uh, demonstrated pretty conclusively that uh, writing the tests before you write the code can lead to good outcomes. And this is known as test-driven development. One of the advantages of this approach is that developers think about what it means for the problem to be correct, not just what you're trying to do or what the function is trying to do. Um, another advantage is that the tests themselves because they're comprehensive and they've been written a priori, uh, become a specification for the, the resulting program. There are some challenges to this approach, however. Um, care has to be taken in how you write the tests. Um, you have to think very carefully about you know, what the test should be testing um, because there's no code associated with it initially. Um, so that can be a little bit of a different paradigm that people are used to doing and so it can be a little bit challenging. You also need to run the test very frequently and this is where uh, techniques like continuous integration come in um, which allow you to run the tests on a very regular basis and we'll talk more about that in the continuous integration module um, in a future module of the tutorial. Um, the third requirement is that uh, test-driven development is used pretty much universally across the development team. Um, I think it'd be difficult to have some people working, writing tests uh, up front and then others writing tests uh, later on or forgetting to write them or whatever. Uh, really the development team needs to uh, be doing the same thing for it to be really effectively used. So the test-driven development methodology has found to be successful pretty broadly across the software engineering community. But what does it actually look like? Or how do you do it? Um, well, the way it works is something like this. So the first uh, step is to actually write a test that describes um, a 
particular aspect of the program that you want to implement. So you have to think about what it is that uh, means that that uh, functionality or that aspect of the program uh, would be correct before you actually write the code. So that can be somewhat of a little bit of a challenge for some people. Once you've done that, um, you run the tests and of course the test that you've just written is going to fail because that feature doesn't exist yet. So the next step is to write just enough code to make, to make that test pass. And that may require a number of iterations, um, writing some code, running the test, writing the code, running the test, and so forth, um, until uh, you get to the point where the tests pass. Uh, now, in that iterative process, you may have made some shortcuts or you know, done, introduced some temporary code or done some things that maybe um, are not uh, the best from a sustainability point of view. So the next thing that we do once the, once the code has been written and the test pass is to refactor the code and remove any um, extraneous things that you've added and make sure the code conforms to um, any requirements that the project might have. And at that point, you've um, uh, reached the uh, a point where you have implemented a new piece of functionality and so we can move on to the next piece of functionality that you are interested in implementing and beginning the same process again. And then we iterate on that, uh, writing a test, implementing a piece of functionality and continuing to do that until we have uh, completed the specification of the program. Now, research software has some pretty unique challenges compared to traditional software. Um, the, the, the primary thing is that research software is essentially exploring areas where we don't really have an expected outcome. We don't really know what the result is going to be. Um, and even after all the expected behavior of the, of the program has been checked, um, we still have to rely on domain experts to help validate the model and uh, to iterate on the design. So it's a little bit different to traditional software engineering where you have a pretty clear idea of what the outcome is going to be and you can just go and implement it. Um, and so that can introduce some challenges into the way testing is done. Um, legacy codes are another area that can cause some difficulties. Um, legacy codes typically have a lot of uh, expected behaviors, but uh, they may not have had any tests written for them or tests may uh, have been lost in the midst of time. Um, and adding new tests can be quite a difficult problem. Um, it, we may not know much about the code. We don't know how it interacts, how parts of the code interact with each other and even what they're supposed to be doing. And so uh, writing tests for that can be quite challenging. Um, typically in a test-driven development approach, um, the accepted uh, way to move forward with legacy codes is not to try and um, implement tests for everything, but just to begin implementing tests for new functionality and new code that's being added. And then the third group of codes is uh, a code that we are trying to release and make available to a broader community. Um, and uh, typically what's required in those uh, circumstances is a very thorough code review that verifies each part of the code, addresses what its intended use is, um, and to ensure that you know, code defects don't get through. So the testing approach could be quite different to you know, a traditional testing methodology. Okay, in the first example, I'm going to show you how to set up a new Python project that you can immediately start using to develop and test uh, and implement code. Uh, although it's pretty easy to start coding with Python using Jupyter Notebooks or just a simple text file, it's more complex to create a maintainable package that can be distributed with a package manager um, such as PyPy. 
Um, so first of all, in order to do this, we're going to install a couple of Python packages if you don't already have them installed. We're going to use something called Pi Scaffold to create um, a Python package that includes the necessary files uh, for the packaging and for the building. Um, so we run the command pi, uh, pip install pi scaffold and that should install that pi scaffold uh, package. Then we're going to use another package called tox that manages the tests for the project and we install that using uh, pip install tox. So that's really all that's necessary to uh, begin to, to start uh, using these two packages. Now, uh, Pi Scaffold provides a command called put up, um, which essentially creates a new project um, with the scaffolding uh, and also incorporates a number of text, uh, tests in it um, with a skeleton um, uh, module that you can then modify to uh, create your own program. So we run the put up auto QCT, we're just calling this, this project uh, auto QCT, um, and that will create a directory and you can inspect that directory if you CD into it. Um, you can <clears throat> see the tests that have been created in the scaffold that you can then modify. Um, when you want to run the tests, you simply run the, the tox command. And then you'll see an output that looks something like this. Um, so it actually runs PyTest on your behalf, um, runs the couple of tests, so it creates a Fibonacci test, um, and then a main test, and they get run. As a bonus, it will also uh, run a code coverage command and show you how much uh, code coverage your tests um, uh, are achieving. Um, you can also customize the template to import your own project files and test them. And it also has some nice presets for documenting with Sphinx and uh, releasing your package via the PyPy package repository. For codes that are based on C, C++ or Fortran, uh, the C make build system is pretty popular. Um, and CMake itself provides a pretty easy way to build tests with a C-Test framework that is enabled by default. Um, and basically you just have to add a few things to your CMake file and um, you can start testing. Um, after you've written a few tests, however, you probably want to use a more sophisticated library like Google Test or Catch2 um, that make your tests more readable and, and makes it easier to write the tests. There's a project called BLT um, that comes out of Livermore that actually provides a set of CMake files designed for building with uh, Google Test um, or Fruit uh, for Fortran. Um, it also does code coverage and continuous integration. Um, it's nicely documented and has a set of instructions exactly how to add it to your project. Um, so in this example, um, we show uh, we can easily create a CMake list.txt file, um, add a few uh, typical CMake macros, and then at the end of that, uh, we can have the line include blt, set up blt.cmake, and that will um, incorporate all the blt CMake um, functionality into your project. We can then clone the BLT repo uh, directly into the source uh, of your project um, and then create a build directory and CD into that build directory um, which is where we're going to actually build the project. Um, we need to issue the CMake command to, uh, so that will actually read the cmakelists.txt file and generate the make files that uh, builds the project and runs the tests. Then we can run a make command, um, which will then go through and build the executable. And as you can see, I've just shown the last few lines here. It eventually builds um, a, uh, a target, which is a test executable. And then we can issue a make test command, um, which will run ctest. And, um, 
run the tests and as you can see that they've passed. Okay, so if you want to explore further, um, for C, C++ and Fortran, there's a variety of different um, tools uh, for running and reporting on tests. C Dash is a, is a reporting and monitoring tool. Uh, PF Unit is a, a Fortran unit test framework. And Flash Test is a test framework that's being developed by the um, uh, Exascale Computing Project. There's also some code coverage tools, static analysis tools, and then there's a similar set of tools for Python as well. So even if you're uh, using a test-driven development methodology where you're writing the test first, it is useful to know how much code is actually being tested. And that's where code coverage tools come in. Um, and these tools essentially allow you to um, uh, visualize you know, which lines of code are actually being tested and there's a number of different tools. GCOV is a standard utility that comes with the GNU compiler. Um, there are other code coverage tools for different languages. Um, there's also LCOV, which is a uh, graphical front end for GCOV and allows you to visualize some of the results. In order to use a tool like GCOV, um, it's fairly straightforward. You need to uh, a, um, use a particular option when you're compiling the, the code um, and then you can run the code and uh, use the GCOV tool that, uh, that will uh, take the automatically generated output and annotate the source code um, with the coverage information. And you can see here that um, uh, the source code's been annotated um, and it will tell you how many times uh, the, a particular line has been executed and it will also annotate lines that are not executed at all with these pound signs. Um, so you can see in this case um, the first branch in the if statement has been executed but the subsequent branches have not been executed. So you can use that to inform you, yourself on what tests, uh, additional testing capability is necessary. Um, there are also graphical tools. There's an online tool um, that will, will help you visualize uh, code coverage, particularly for large projects. Okay, for the last part of this module, I want to uh, turn to a walkthrough of uh, using test-driven development on a larger, more complex code. And uh, we're going to look at the Hello Numerical World example, um, which is essentially implementation of a heat equation. Um, there's a, a um, a, a number of source files that are provided already that implement um, the framework for how this code actually runs and it also has a swappable uh, set of kernels um, that implement uh, different algorithms for computing the heat equations. Um, and we're going to add a new kernel using a test-driven development methodology. So uh, once you've downloaded the code, you can uh, build it and run it initially. Uh, first of all, invoke CMake and then uh, the make command, um, and then you should be it should the build should complete successfully, and you should be able to uh, run the uh, code using the FTCS algorithm, um, and um, it it should complete successfully without any errors. So. We want to add a new kernel to this code, and we want to, we want to also use the test-driven development methodology. So uh, using that, uh, we need to add a test first. Um, so the question we need to ask ourselves is actually, what do we test? Um, and there's a variety of different things we might be testing. We could look at the arguments that are being passed to the function, make sure they're correct, or that bad cases are detected, and so forth. Um, we, we can look at um, the convergence of the algorithm and see whether it uh, reaches a steady, steady state at some point. We can look at some other factors such as the solution time dependent, dependence um, or we can look at multiple precisions and so forth. So there's a lot of different things we can look at. Um, what we've done is provided a 
uh, script that will uh, do the steady state test. So we're going to use that as our test um, for the kernels. Um, and uh, essentially this, this script just tech tests the result of, the, of a particular run against the actual expected values. And if, it, uh, is, if it's within a certain error limit, then it will just uh, say that it was successful, otherwise not. And we're going to use this as the basis of our test. Um, now, our project doesn't have any tests initially um, implemented. Uh, we have that script, but it's not actually being used. So what we need to do is enable testing on the project and then use that script to do the testing. Uh, this is a, a once-only thing that we need to do in order to get the testing running. So we create a directory called test. This is where the test will go. We copy the script into that directory and then we change into that directory and create a cmakelist.txt file in the test directory. Um, that is the uh, cmake file that drives the testing process. We just need to add a few lines to that. Um, the first line, enable testing turns on testing uh, uh, for CMake and then we add uh, lines that add tests uh, that we want to run when we uh, do the test, when we run the tests. And these can do anything uh, but in our case we're going to add tests that run this script. And uh, in particular we're going to add a test to test the existing kernel, the FTCS kernel, um, we may not want to do that in a legacy code, but we'll do it in this case. And we're also going to add a test for our new kernel, Upwind 15, which hasn't been implemented yet. Uh, then we have to rerun CMake to enable these tests. And again, this is a once only thing that we do. Uh, and from, from now on, the tests will be enabled and they they can be run just run by running the ctest command. So to enable the test, we change back to the parent directory. We run the cmake command with a, uh, a macro build test set to on, and that will pick up the test directory in the cmake list.txt file in there and build the appropriate make files. Um, then we can cd back into that test directory and run the tests. And as expected, the uh, first test for the FTCS kernel uh, succeeds and the second test for the Upwind 15 test uh, kernel fails because we haven't implemented it yet. So now we're at the part of the uh, test driven development uh, methodology where we actually are going to implement the kernel. Uh, we've already provided a source code containing the kernel but it still needs to be um, added to the main driver code. And to do that, you edit the heat.c file, um, add a prototype for the, uh, the new kernel. We also need to modify the assertion that checks to make sure the arguments are valid. And then finally, um, add a branch to the if statement to um, call the kernel, assuming that the kernel algorithm has been selected. The other thing that we need to do is uh, modify the cmakelists.txt file in the, in the main directory and add the new source file to that. Um, this is something that you may or may not have to do depending on what the code change is. But typically if you're adding new source files you will have to add uh, that uh, the, the new source file to the uh, cmakelist.txt file. If you're just changing an existing source file you wouldn't need to do this. Um, but in this case we add it and then we have to rebuild the executable because we're adding a um, new functionality. Now we're ready to rerun the tests and so we do that by changing into the test directory and running the ctest command. And as expected the uh, the FTCS kernel passes the test, and uh, which it did before, but now also our new kernel passes the test. And uh, with that, we have completed the first iteration of our test-driven development cycle.
once you've tried uh, the example that we've got here, here are some ideas that uh, you might uh, use to, you know, uh, try out some different testing strategies. Okay, in summary, um, a productive software team is always checking their work in some way using testing or some other mechanism. Um, it's a good idea to uh, mirror the logical structure of your, co your code with your tests, um, which really facilitates understanding how the tests relate to the code. As we discussed, there are many different challenges associated with different types of projects, and you're going to need to adapt your strategy to fit with your particular situation. Finally, don't get too distracted by all the technologies out there. Just focus on something, pick something, and uh, run with that. Just a couple of resources. Uh, these two books I found very valuable um, and would highly recommend them if you're really interested in learning more about testing and how to work with uh, scientific codes.